Well, since my baby left me, I found a new place to dwell. It's down at the end of Lonely Street at Heartbreak Hotel. And I'll be, I'll be so lonely, baby. Well, I'm so lonely. I'll be so lonely, I could die. Although it's always crowded, you still can find some room. Hi, I'm Scotty Moore. Had three brothers, and my dad all played instruments. And it was 14 years difference between the, me and the next one up the line. And by the time I got around 10, 11, 12 years old, well, everybody was gone. My dad got old enough he didn't want to mess with it anymore, and that pretty much tells the story. And I stayed out of school for one year, and my dad said it's okay. If you stay out of school, you got to got to help me on the farm, which I did. So he gave me a year, gave me a an acre of cotton, and I bought a big Gibson flat top guitar with that proceeds off of that one acre of cotton. And that was my that's when I started with Gibson. It's actually more than fifty years. But uh, so then, at uh, when I was fifteen, uh, after uh, uh, I joined the Navy and played a bunch of uh, Japanese uh, lookalikes guitars in the Navy, and the the frets were made out of beer cans. I'm sure because he played one thirty minutes and the, the, he was wore out. And so when I came out of the Navy. After being in there four years, I I bought a uh, uh, a Fender Esquire, and of course in the Navy I'd always always been sitting down playing. And when I started playing around around in Memphis, uh, was standing up and I couldn't hold it the Fender. So that and I was walking downtown main uh, downtown by the music store, OK Hauk, and they had just put a ES-295 in the window, and I saw it in that gold, I said, got to have it, don't care what kind, what it is, where it came from, I got to have it. And then I played that for uh, two or three years, I guess, through the early Elvis uh, years, and then, and then I bought a, uh, an L5, uh, blonde L5. See, back in the early days, any orchestra, they didn't tell you who was playing in the band. They also, the only, actually, the only people that uh, they knew anything about was like Chet Atkins and Merle Travis. And uh, later, a little bit later on, I heard I was listening to Les Paul, and uh, but. Uh, some of the other great players were on, they were studio players mainly, and they were on all kind of records, but you never knew it. And I'd just pick up a note here and there, but not from any particular person. And uh, not until uh, several years later did I start hearing, you know, got to meet some of these people. Back in my early days, from when I was at home, it was just pure hard-headedness. I was going to learn to play because I'd missed out all of whatever my dad and my three brothers had been doing. <laughs> and uh, when, when they were all at home before they uh, got married and left home, uh, they were all playing. They had all played around home, but uh, just nothing, not professionally, but uh, yeah, trying to find somewhere to play was the biggest problem. When I first uh, got back to Memphis, and there was first thing you have to do get your name out to different people, and uh, but there wasn't any bands. Uh, there was no set groups in any of the clubs or anything, and uh, that really disturbed me. I couldn't. It just it was. It was really rough, and. In meeting several people in the, around, that's how it 
had, had met Bill Black, uh, and I talked to him, and then uh, the other guys that eventually was in the, it, we worked together. I found enough to work together. That I said, now look, I'm gonna start a band. You guys want to uh, want to be in it? And I said, if I get uh, get work for us this coming weekend, fine. But if I don't have anything by like Wednesday, then you're free. If you get a call between Wednesday and the weekend, you go ahead and do whatever. And this group was called the Starlight Wranglers. I had uh, lead singer, which was Doug Poindexter. He also played guitar. Uh, Tommy Seeley played, uh, was a fiddle player. Clyde Rush was a, was a rhythm guitar player. And uh, who am I missing? Me, mm -hmm. I was in there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Miller Dial played steel guitar. It, you would say, well, it was country instruments, but you had to play Playing these jobs, you had to play for, for people to dance. It could be a pop song, it could be a country song, but it had to be where they could dance to it. People didn't care what it was. They, they didn't really care what how I many was in the band or anything like that. It, it, it was just an added attraction, you know. I had formed this group of guys I was telling you about called the Starlight Wranglers, and we we got a radio show. Uh, Saturdays, 15 minutes, and we could uh, promote uh, wherever we were playing that night, which helped a little. Then I found out that uh, that there was a, a Memphis recording service uh, that the guy had a record label also. So I went, went down to see him, which was Sam Phillips. And uh, he agreed to let us come in. We went in and we just played our, our uh, played some of the tunes that we've been playing on stage, not not our own stuff. And he said, "I like the band and everything. So if you'll get some some of your own material to so come back, and I'd like to listen to it again." Myself and uh, uh, and Doug Poindexter and uh, and my oldest brother uh, Carney, we wrote uh, uh, sat down and wrote two songs. And then we went back in to call Sam, and we went back in and, and played these two things for him, and he liked them and, and put those out. So I already had some connection with Sun on this, from this. And uh, I think maybe might have sold eight records, <laughs> or maybe ten, I don't know. I never did get a get a a strong count on it, but even anyway, from that uh, that experience, uh, I became good friends with Sam, and uh, uh, I'd go by drive by the studio a lot of times. If he wasn't busy, I'd drop in, and we'd go next door to Miss Taylor's restaurant and have coffee and just talk about the business in general. Uh, nothing, nothing playing with anybody, just to just chit chat. And uh, so one day, this was on a Saturday, I drove by there and uh, uh, he wasn't busy and, and we went next door and was having coffee and Marion, his secretary, came over and was having coffee with us. And uh, again, just chit-chatting about the, the business in general, nothing, did you hear so-and-so or something and the, that kind of thing. and. And uh, Marion spoke up and said, uh, said "Say, said, did you ever uh, think any more about that guy that was uh, was in here a few weeks back?" And he said, uh, he was, "No, didn't make any comment or anything." So a couple of weeks went by, and I was in there again. I asked him. I said, "By the way, I said, did you ever?" Because it just stuck in my mind. And uh, I said, "Did you ever?" Uh, Contact that guy that you said was in here uh, that you liked or had listened to or something. I don't remember exactly what I said. And he said, 
No, it didn't. He turned to Marion again. Said, uh, said Marion, said go, said go over and get that boy's uh, uh, telephone number and give it to Scotty. And said, uh, and he turned to me. Said uh, he still hadn't called his name now through all of this. And and he turned to me. Said, uh, said when you get this number, said you call him and uh, see what get him come in, see what you think, or get him what see what you think. And uh, she came back, brought, handed me a slip of paper, and I looked at it, and I said, that was Presley. What kind of damn name is that? Just, there again, we're sitting at a coffee table just chit-chatting, you know. And uh, so we left, and when I got home, I called, and uh, his mother answered the phone, and I told her, I said, I'm working in conjunction with, with uh Sam Phillips down at Sun Records and uh, would like to talk to 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 Elvis. She said, "Well, he's at uh, at the Suzo's. I believe it was a movie house." Said, "I'll have him call you as soon as he gets in. He should be in pretty soon." And so I guess about an hour later, <clears throat> about an hour later, he called and uh, I told him who I was and asked him to go over to my house the next day and. Uh, which he did, and the Bill Black lived just a few doors down the, on the same street from me. And uh, he came down also that same day, and I listened to him. And as what we know from that on, well, old hell broke loose, didn't it? <laughs> okay, so that was on Monday night, and uh, Sam came out, we listened to the thing we'd just cut, you know, it just cut, and uh, I'm trying to remember what Sam had said, said that uh, he made some comment, I don't remember exactly what he said, but something, and uh, he didn't say like this was a record or anything, or, but after, the ne I think it was the next night that he had, had made an acetate and took it down to Dewey Phillips at WHBQ and to get Dewey's opinion on what he thought about it. And I'm sure you've read the stories where that uh, Dewey had called Elvis and uh, asked him to come down to interview him. And he had, Dewey had sat there and talked to him with the mic open the whole time. <laughs> And he didn't know it, any of that at all. So, uh, anyway, he played the record and he got all the, the radio, got so many calls for it. And then Sam uh, had called me, this was on Monday, Tuesday, so he'd call me, actually on Wednesday. Because he had been down to do his on Tuesday night, had been down to his on Tuesday night. He called me on Wednesday. Uh, and Bill also, and I said, she said, y'all got to come back in. We've got to do a B-side B for a record for this. And that was, so we went in and went through this whole process again, played everything we'd played before and, and uh, sitting there. And Bill was sitting, uh, have you ever seen somebody sit on a bass fiddle? He, Bill was sitting straddle of his bass fiddle. And he started beating it and started singing in a high falsetto voice, uh, Blue Moon of Kentucky. And Elvis knew the records, he knew the lyrics, he started singing with him, and that was the B-side. So we didn't, and we hadn't gone in to, to do a, a, a legitimate record or anything in the first place. We just went in, because all thing Elvis, all thing Sam wanted was a little music behind uh, behind Elvis because if you remember the old uh, things that you used to have in fairs and whatever that you could go in a booth and, and record your voice on it had this little funky uh, recorders and I'm just real tinny and everything well that's basically what, what Elvis I mean what Sam was was uh, him and his secretary was doing the daytime people go in and he wasn't doing this stuff. Tape was very new. And uh, 
a lot of the things that we had put on tape the first night we were in there, he never kept. He, he, he erased them. He did keep two or three things that were later released. Never could figure that out either. Because we did do uh, a few things that I thought was pretty good that he had raised. Sam had asked, asked me and uh, Bill come in. Uh, he, he didn't want the whole band, uh, but he wanted to hear what else would sound like just on tape. So that's the reason it was just the two of us. Every time, every time we went in after the first record, uh, we'd go through the same process. Because there, was there wasn't anybody pitching songs or beating the door down to record this or anything. And so between between the four of us, uh, well, actually, Mary and five, and whatever song anybody could think of, we'd try to play it or see if we could make something out of it in uh, kind of in that same direction, you know, same, same way. And uh, we'd finally hit on something. And that's one reason that uh, uh, I think that he uh, always ended up doing some of Sam's songs that he'd recorded on artists before because he, he liked the, that kind of music. But that wasn't what he was trying to do him personally. It's stuff that he would do, I don't think even with his folks at home, you know, but it was stuff that he liked. Sam was getting orders in locally uh, record stores and everybody was hollering and screaming they wanted the songs and of course he didn't have them and he was trying to get them pressed and uh, it was probably a good uh, probably a week maybe two weeks before he actually had, had any records uh, and uh, I don't remember the exact counts but he had several a few thousand orders already just there in, in Memphis and uh, of course then we, we played a a, a uh, concert there at the Overton Park Shell Slim Whitman I think was a headliner uh I don't remember who all else was on that show. Bob Neal, who was this jockey, uh, had gotten us on that show. Because he, well, of course, we had the radio stations between him and Sleepy Eyed John, uh, opposing stations, they already had it, had the records going. One was playing one song and the other one was playing the backside. So it was that kind of thing going. And the interesting part about that is that when we did that show, the shell is still there, by the way. They they repainted it and Gordon kind of spruced it up a little bit. But uh, uh, we'd only recorded that one song. So we went out there and did that, of course. And now your guitar player, all right, if you keep this in mind, and all the people out there that's watching, if you keep this in mind, if you play, especially if you play guitar, stand up, take the guitar, and play a rhythm. Now, but you got to raise up on the balls of your feet, both feet at the same time while you're playing. Now, in 1954, the pants, the legs were pretty big. Now, you're going to do a bunch of shaking and stuff, right? Or at least your clothes are. Now, that's where it started. That is where it started. When we came off, we did two shows. We did an afternoon show and did a night show. But when we came off the first afternoon, uh, the afternoon show, and I was coming in and he said, uh, talking to Bob Neal and, and Sam said, said what did I do? So those girls in the front row said they was, was laughing and carrying on. What did I do? What did I do wrong? He said nothing. You didn't do anything wrong. He said you was just you were shaking. And Elvis was a very fast learner and a very uh, he, anything that he'd do. Uh, 
uh, if he could tell that the crowd liked it, then he'd, he'd do it again. I mean, he was, I give him credit, he could, he could spot stuff. I was busy trying to find what key it was in, you know. <laughs> you, you remember the old Wiggle and Little Finger? That's part of his stuff. People think it was natural. It was natural. It was natural because he could do it naturally. It made it look natural. But it, it was it was part of the show. Well, uh, Bob, uh, uh, of course, I had signed a contract uh, for a year as manager. This was uh, we were all down at, at Sun one day, and uh, it was asked was talking to Sam. He said, "He said I don't know what to do. I know these people call me, want to do this, want to do that, and and he said, I'll tell you what to do. He said, if once you sign a contract with Scotty for a year, give us the time to find somebody that we 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 trust and like, and that's how that that part came about." And I found out real quick that being a manager wasn't wasn't all it was cut out to be, to tell you the truth. And so then we hooked up with Bob, because Bob Neal had been booking us in a, on a lot of gigs, uh, in especially in Mississippi, because he was on the radio early morning. Started, uh, I don't know, 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning till but he had that early morning drive thing. And we, and we stationed WMPS, WPS, I believe. I'm not sure on that call letters, but uh, boom down in Mississippi, and so he had all the all the cotton pickers and, and concert uh, concert stuff going on down there, and it kept us going, uh, especially on weekends, because Bill and I were still had day jobs, and we went on with that for uh, a couple of months, I guess. And uh, then it started getting, as it gave time, the records started getting out into other stations and such. And then we started uh, uh, going further out, farther out in Mississippi, farther out in Arkansas. And it finally got to the point where we couldn't, we, we couldn't do them in, on, a, on a weekend. And that's when uh, Bill and I both had to quit, quit our day jobs and uh, going full time. So every time we recorded, we did the same same thing. With, uh, and half the time we'd end up doing one of one of Sam's songs because he had a stuff he'd been doing with all of his black artists, you know. That uh, and that's where that's our writing come from. And uh, gosh, I, we tried everything in the world. It wasn't he wasn't pushing his songs. It was just find something that would, that felt good for us to, for us to sing and for us to do. Well, during that period, just, like I was saying, we uh, Bill and I had quit our day jobs, and we had signed. Uh, we actually signed Bob Neal for a manager uh, before that year was up. It was I guess. I don't, I don't remember exact dates, but, uh, and then when we had quit our day jobs, then he was started booking us out further away. And in the meantime, we'd gone to the Opry and got, uh, didn't get do any good up there. I'm sure everybody's seen that little episode in, uh, following, uh, week or two weeks later, I think, went to uh, Shreveport uh, for the Louisiana Hayride, and uh, and that's where we met uh, we met DJ at that point, and he he played with us behind the curtain. That's when we. Uh, he, that's one thing he tell. We got him out from behind the curtain. <laughs> His claim to fame. <laughs> Uh, and during that process is when uh, Tom Parker had been snooping around and had spotted him and people were telling him about him and he was 
uh, was actually going in to see shows, but nobody knew he was there or anything. And he actually worked worked his way in to take over finally over. You know, I've got a letter somewhere here that uh, while he was uh, while Parker was uh, promoting uh, Eddie Arnold and uh, he had Tom Diskin, his right hand man, had an office in Chicago, and I found that I didn't know anything about any any anybody in that, but uh, it was called Jamboree Attractions. And his office was in Chicago, and I'd sent a letter up there, and we got turned down. So, I'll give you a little insight of <laughs> all that part of it. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, then of course he signed with RCA at that point, uh, and we then cut uh, went to Nashville. And uh, made the first session for RCA, which was uh, Heartbreak Hotel. Like I said, we had met DJ uh, at Shreveport, and he played with us on the Hayride the first time. But uh, we not not had any money to begin with in that, that period of time, but. Every time we would go out on past out of Memphis, uh, in anywhere in that general direction towards Shreveport, we'd call DJ and and if it was feasible for us to go through and pick him up, or if it was where he could drive and meet us at some of those places in in uh, East Texas or or somewhere like that, uh, well, he played with us. But the first time he, that he actually played with it, uh, that actually recorded with us, was Heartbreak Hotel in uh, in Nashville. Fortunately, other than a few of the movie things that we worked on later on, uh, that's where we always worked. We'd go in, even after Elvis uh, had it, the publishing companies and all this, well, they'd bring in loads of big stack of demos and things for him to listen to. and. Uh, We never would listen to him. We'd drink coffee or do whatever till they always picked a song out of the stack. And then once he picked a song out, uh, then we'd listen to it and then we'd learn it and then try it and see if we could do it. But he never he never told anybody what to play. We Everything that you heard uh, in all those early days was just our own invention. Good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, that was it. <laughs> yeah, like I said, what? Of course, when we got into movies, there was a lot of things that they would. Uh, I hate to admit that we actually played on some of them. To tell you the truth, things happened too fast back then. That was one problem. Uh, like when I came out of the navy, and uh, actually, actually, when I had gone to. To to uh, to see Sam to uh, in the very early days, I had a day job already. I went to work for my oldest brother at his cleaning plant, the University Park Cleaners, and learned to be a hatter. And hats was really a good business at that time. And. I was very happy with what I was doing. If I could play, play a little bit on the weekend at a uh, club, and uh, till I had the day job, I'd be through by two thirty in the afternoon, and I had a lot of free time that way. And uh, just that, that I didn't see any need to do it. There wasn't any, wasn't wasn't high on my on my list. But after I got it, got tied in with the everything else, I could see. Then I was going, we were going, always going so much I didn't have time. <laughs> when we started doing movies, and when we were 
he had us in the first two, three movies, like background or something. Uh, well, you know, sometimes it'd take them an hour to reset and do all that, and we were sitting around where you doing nothing, you know. So Elvis got me said, well, well I'd take my amplifier, because they didn't furnish nothing. I'd have my amplifier sitting on stage, so he'd get the electricians to, to run a line over and plug it in, and we'd just start jamming out there on the session. And pretty soon, all, all the guys on the set would, were they supposed to be resetting and doing everything else? They, all of them would gather around, and we just they were doing a show for them. <laughs> Well, we got we got tight for stuff we was doing on that we were doing on stage. Uh, I used to fuss at DJ and Bill all the time. We was on the road. I said, "Let's we be together and work up some stuff." I don't know. You be sure to lay a DJ when you can see him today. Tell him, hey, yeah. no, 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 hell no. The B side. Let's go to bar. Let's get a drink. <laughs> I didn't bring all my drums up here to room. I said, "You play on a snag." No, no, I'll do that. Hound Dog was a B side of "Don't Be Cruel." Those two were cut in New York, and I knew there was I knew there was two that was cut uh, was released together and were both two sided hits. Don't be cruel to a heart that's true. Well, since my baby left me, I found a new... There's nothing that I do uh, any different. I never liked a bunch of highs is the only thing. But also, uh, it's got to have a guitar cut. If it's recording, it's got to have enough that it'll cut through. It's just like a regular amplifier. The only thing is, it's uh, Ray Butts built this amp for me. After the first record we did, uh, well, Blue Moon, uh, Blue Moon, Kentucky, because it had slapback on it. Sam had, uh, he says that he discovered it by mistake. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, you take the output of a tape machine and then run it back into another machine and you get that, this, this, that slight delay from the two playback heads. And it gives it that slapback effect, and he was using that on on early the early r records. Well, so we would go out and play uh, at little schoolhouses or whatever. Well, it's always sounded empty because it's it had a better with the slapback. It had fuller sound, and not then I heard this amp. Uh, Ray Butts up in Cairo, Illinois built it. And it actually has a tape in the in the bottom of it, it goes round and round, and you could adjust it, and I could get the same effect with, uh, with that way. But that wasn't really, I kept my tone was about the same like it was just playing straight. It wasn't any different. Very first record, I, yeah, first record I used it on was Mr. Train. Now some, so some records I didn't use it, I wasn't using the effect on. Uh, I don't, don't remember right off hand which ones, but uh, some of them it just played just like it was a plain amplifier. Well, the their game was very simple. Uh, Chad Atkins, in fact, in fact, played rhythm guitar on that session. And it's, it's, his rhythm guitar is very bared. You barely can hear it. But the, the drums, uh, nothing is very loud music-wise. And... Uh, the uh, the thing that I played on it was uh, very simple, just a little. Uh, uh, that was all. <laughs> the rest of it was just a rhythm. <laughs> but. Uh, you ask me why I played that, I don't know. Just what I heard for that particular song. And uh, it's always been that way. I'd ever, uh, never had any kind of plan for anything. Uh, 
Nobody ever told me what to play. If they did, it wouldn't have made any difference. I could have played it anyway. Especially if he told me. Scotty Moore's guitar tone is the quintessential rockabilly guitar sound, and that's based on a few important elements. The first being an arch top hollow body electric guitar, uh, like his ES-295 that he played for most of those early recordings. And it seems to me that he tended to use the middle position uh, for the pickup selector switch. Uh, in other words, combining the bridge and the neck pickup together for most of the, the sound. Maybe in some recordings he'd use the bridge uh, as well. Um, as far as the EQ on the amp goes, it's pretty even. One of the things he did mention in the interviews is that he didn't really like guitar tones that had too much treble in them. So you notice on the uh, amp EQ here, I have them set in the middle. Although, of course, each amp is really different as far as the EQ. You just want to find a good balance uh, and not get too piercing a treble uh, sound. And um, one important thing is with the bass on, an, on a hollow electric guitar, it's very important to not get too much bass because the guitar itself has, has a good amount of bass to begin with, but if you add too much bass, it's really going to feed back a lot, especially at higher volumes. You have to be careful about that. Um, and of course, the critical element behind the rockabilly sound is the slapback echo. Scotty's Echo Sonic amp that was designed by and built by Ray Butts uh, actually had a tape delay in the bottom of it, uh, a tape head that actually would play back what he played about 100 milliseconds or uh, about 100 milliseconds behind what he actually played, so it would actually echo it with a tape echo. And uh, before he got that amp, he was playing, I think, through a Fender Deluxe uh, amp in the, in the early Sun Records, things like That's All Right, Mom, on those first sessions. Um, he was playing just a, a straight tube amp, like a Fender Deluxe. But Sam Phillips was actually, uh, who was the engineer on those sessions, was actually uh, using tape delay in the, in the recording booth. So he would actually play what he had recorded through another tape deck and run it back in. And that uh, slapback echo was around that 100 millisecond, 100, 115, 120 millisecond kind of uh, area. And you can emulate that with a digital delay pedal uh, or you know, analog delay pedal. Uh, it's really not rocket science, you just set it so you get that that quick repeat. And uh, for those kind of sounds, it just kind of fills up the sound a little more. Um, it's important that the echo is almost as loud as the actual note you're playing, if not as loud, and that it doesn't repeat too much. So that's just one or two quick repeats on things like Heartbreak Hotel. You almost don't perceive uh, an echo after the sound so much as you just hear it fatten up the tone. And um, one last thing you can do to really get that vintage kind of sound is maybe use some spring reverb. This amp has some spring reverb built into it in the back and uh, it just kind of helps the 50s and 60s vibe if you have a good tube amp with a spring reverb, although I don't really hear to be honest, that much spring reverb in Scotty's actual tone, it definitely is part of the rockabilly sound. And if you do use the spring reverb, you just want to be uh, sparing with it because you don't want to combine too much echo with too much spring reverb. That can really muddy up the tone. So that's the Scotty Moore guitar tone. The form is really an abbreviated uh, blues form. It's eight measures long rather than 12. I'm going to play the whole part in time and then explain it slowly. One, two, three. So you can hear the uh, the hybrid picking idea on the uh, on the A7 and the E chord, very understated. But it starts out with an E major chord in the 12th position. This is simply like the F major form, F major shape in first position, just moved up to the 12th fret. So that's the first finger on the 12th fret of the strings, one and two. Second finger on the 13th fret of the third string, and the third finger on the 14th fret of the fourth string. And of course, the kicks in the beginning, first two measures, one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. And just on the end up to three and then down bit of four. 
So measures, um, the third and fourth measure are just empty, just vocals, and the bass walks down in the fourth measure, which leads to the fifth measure where you're playing an A7 chord. So my first finger's across the entire fifth fret on all six strings, my second finger's on the sixth fret of the third string, my third finger's on the seventh fret of the fifth string, and my fourth finger's on the eighth fret of the second string. So what we're gonna do here is a hybrid picking. You're gonna pick the bass notes with a pick, the low strings, and then pick the higher strings with your fingers. So the simple pattern here that I'm using is uh, starting with the sixth string and then picking the second string and then the fourth string and then lifting the fourth finger off to get the fifth fret on the second string. So back to the sixth string and then back to the eighth fret on the second string and then the third and fourth string. So. playing that twice in a row. Of course, you could vary that in different ways. Hit the first string on top or whatever. As long as you're getting the bass notes really on the downbeat and the higher notes on the offbeats, um, you get the, the right effect. So two measures of A, and then moving up to B7, same sort of idea. And on this recording, it's really understated. He plays it different a few different times. So one measure of B, and then into the E7. So for E7, I'm hammering the open third string into the first fret, like that, just a hammer on, and then the open first string, second fret on the fourth string, third fret on the second string, open sixth string, to the open uh, first string, and then to the third fret on the second string, so good. like that. And um, there is one fill, um, the last time through the form, there's a fill in the fourth measure, which would be that bass walk down measure that's normally empty. He plays a triplet fill that sounds like this. Very simple. So you're just on the 12th fret of the uh, second and third string and the 14th fret of the second and third string. And the idea is to play this in triplet, triplets, just alternating the, uh, the, sec the 12th and the 14th fret. So you get triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet, like that. Simple as that. Um, so that's really the whole part. The only uh, part beyond that is during the piano solo, right after the guitar solo, where he simply comps the changes. He just plays in quarter notes like this, A7 to B7 to E. And so for the A7 or A9 chord, I'm actually playing uh, the first finger on the 11th fret of the fourth string, second finger on the 12th fret of the fifth string, and then the third finger across strings two and three at the 12th fret. So that's A9, or A dominant seven add nine, to B7 is the same B7 we had before, and then to E, E7. So for this E7 chord, this is uh, like sort of a C shape E7 chord. So my first finger's on the fifth fret of the second string, my second finger is on the sixth fret of the fourth string, my third finger is on the seventh fret of the fifth string, and my fourth finger is on the seventh fret of the third string, to E7. So that's the electric rhythm guitar and form for Heartbreak Hotel. I'm going to play the Heartbreak Hotel solo in time and then slow it down for you. So that starts with a double stop, just the 12th fret on strings 1 and 2, played in a triplet, so you get... Then to the 12th fret on the 2nd string, the 15th fret on the second string to the 12th fret on the first string. You're just going to bend that 15th fret just slightly out of tune. And the second measure you're going to do a similar thing. You're just uh, going to end on the 15th fret on that second string. The third measure is exactly the same as the first. And the very last measure you're going to actually go up to the 16th fret with the fourth finger on the second string. Bend that a half a step while you're hitting the 12th fret on the first string with it. So you can, and you're just strumming that in, in triplets as you hold that bend, so you get. So the whole thing again is. Good. 
And that's the electric guitar solo for Heartbreak Hotel. You could die. chord for the electric guitar in Heartbreak Hotel is actually E major 7 and you're just going to slide from the 5th fret uh, on the top 3 strings which is actually F major 7 down a fret to E major 7 at the 4th fret so it goes 2 and starts on B2 and when you hear that chord against the E bass note that makes a full E major 7 chord so again 1, 2 and and just let it ring and that's the ending for the electric guitar in Heartbreak Hotel This is the electric performance of Heartbreak Hotel. Well, since my baby left me, I found a new place to dwell. It's down at the end of Lonely Street at Heartbreak Hotel. And I'll be, I'll be so lonely, baby. Well, I'm so lonely. I'll be so lonely, I could die. Although it's always crowded, you still can find some room. For broken hearted lovers to cry there in the gloom And I'll be, they'll be so lonely, baby They get so lonely, they get so lonely They could die Now the bellhop's tears keep flowing The desk clerk's dressed in black They've been so long on lonely street They'll never, never look back They get so, they get so lonely They get so lonely well, they're so lonely, they could die Well, now if your baby leaves you You've got a tale to tell Just take a walk on Lonely Street To Heartbreak Hotel and go away. You'll feel so lonely, yeah You'll feel so lonely, baby You'll be so lonely, you could die some room for broken hearted lovers to cry there in the gloom and be so, they'll be so lonely babe, they'll be so lonely babe, they'll be so lonely they could die. This is Heartbreak Hotel by Elvis Presley, and the acoustic guitar is pretty minimal in this recording, and what I'm going to do is explain the acoustic guitar from the perspective of understanding the form of the song. And the form of the song really is an abbreviated blues form in the key of E, and by abbreviated I mean a normal blues form would be 12 measures long, and this song actually has an 8 measure pattern. So the first chord is an E chord, or an E7, so you can think of E7 as adding the D note, the uh, third fret of the second string, to the basic open E chord. And the first four measures, you're basically going to play one, two, three, and four, one, two, three, and four. So it has those kicks uh, on the offbeat of three into the downbeat of beat four. Again, one, two, three, and four, one, two, three, and four. The next two measures, um, you're actually not playing through. This is where the vocals come in, and then there's a bass walk down into an A7 chord in the fifth measure. So for A7, I'm just laying my uh, first finger across the second fret, strings one through four of the open fifth string, and I'm adding G on top with the third finger on the third fret of the first string. And this is actually where, where Elvis would come in strumming the acoustic guitar. He actually never in those, uh, in the recording or even in the videos that I've watched, ever plays the E chord at all on the acoustic. He comes in at the A7 chord with a very simple quarter note strumming pattern in downstrokes. You could strum like this too, more in an eighth note kind of thing, where you're just accenting the down strums. So two bars of A7. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. 
into the seventh measure, which is B7. So for this chord, this would be the trickiest chord in the song. And the first finger is on the first fret of the fourth string, the second finger is on the second fret of the fifth string, third finger is on the second fret of the third string of the open second string, and my fourth finger is on the second fret of the first string. Again, just strumming quarter notes. One, two, three, four, and back to E for the eighth measure. So again, that is uh, fifth through eighth measure where Elvis would actually play. It would sound like this. A, A, B7, back to E. And again, on the first four measures that are just the, the E chord kicks, um, again, Elvis didn't really play. Although, when the guitar solo comes in, because the guitar solo is through the entire eight measure form, or actually the first four measures of that, and then there's a piano solo for measures five through eight, um, you just want to go ahead and strum that E. So you get. You could add that E7 right into A to B. So for the performance track on the acoustic, I'm going to go ahead and just play all of those chords just to uh, hopefully outline the form for you so you can see exactly what chords go where. But again, uh, Elvis really came in at the A to the B7 and the E, measures 5 through 8 on each of the forms. So that's the acoustic guitar for Heartbreak Hotel. This is the acoustic performance of Heartbreak Hotel. Well, since my baby left me, I found a new place to dwell. It's down at the end of Lonely Street at Heartbreak Hotel. And I'll be, I'll be so lonely, baby. Well, I'm so lonely. I'll be so lonely, I could die. Although it's always crowded, you still can find some room. For broken hearted lovers to cry there in the gloom And I'll be, they'll be so lonely, baby They get so lonely, they get so lonely They could die Now the bellhop's tears keep flowing The desk clerk's dressed in black They've been so long on lonely street They'll never, never look back They get so, they get so lonely They get so lonely Got a tale to tell Just take a walk on Lonely Street To Heartbreak Hotel You'll, you'll feel so lonely yeah. You'll feel so lonely, babe You'll be so lonely You could die some room for broken hearted lovers to cry there in the gloom and be so, they'll be so lonely, babe, they'll be so lonely, babe, they'll be so lonely, they could die. 